Excerpt from Satirical History of Vermont. New all too true blue alternative state histories. 1754 to 1763. Vermonters in French and Indian War. During the French and Indian War, some Vermonters aided British soldiers in their attacks on French in the area. It could be said, after all, that these Vermonters, by joining the colonial militia, were aiding and abetting the British. This means they were helping them, because they were betting they, the British, were going to win, and they wanted to end up on the winning side of the conflict more than anything else. Besides, they couldn't understand the Frenchman's lingo anyway. By the end of this war, in 1763, Britain had gained control of the region, having whipped the French. The British flexed their muscles and pounded their chest by changing the name of Lake Escargot to Lake Memphremagog. Lake Escargot sounded too Frenchified to them. 1770. Ethan Allen forms the Green Mountain Boys. Ethan Allen, along with his brothers Ira and Levi, plus another cat named Seth Warner, formed a Roots music band. They called themselves the Green Mountain Boys. The musical genre played by the Green Mountain Boys was called Greengrass. This musical style was the Yankee answer to Kentucky's bluegrass music. Actually, bluegrass and greengrass are basically the same, both descended from grass music, but greengrass uses more cowbell than bluegrass does. By 1775, the Green Mountain Boys were so popular that they won the Battle of the Grass Bands at Fort Taiwanonderoga, Beston, Bob Marley, and Willie Nelson. Here's Ethan, waving to his adorned fans after his cowbell-laden rendition of Don't Fear the Rapper. Having done it all in the music business, in his golden years, Allen applied his hand to making furniture. 1791, Statehood. In 1791, Vermont became a state, the first state that wasn't one of the 13 original colonies. 1812, Merino sheep introduced. Merino sheep were introduced to Vermont in 1812. The Vermonter said, Hi, sheep. The sheep replied, Bah! A couple in Florida named their son after these sheep, and this son, Dan, ended up playing quarterback for the Miami Dolphins. But Florida history has no place in this tome, so let's get back to Vermont and the Merino sheep there. Following this satisfactory introduction of said critters to said Yankees, a lot of shearing went on from that time forward. Here's a specimen of the sheep, that is. Does this wool make me look fat? 1837, steel plow and electric motor. In 1837, John Deere of Rutland patented the steel plow. Prior to that, plows had been made of diamonds. Diamonds were so expensive, though, that few farmers could really afford them. Deer thought that steel would be good enough and eventually pay for themselves due to the greatly decreased upfront cost. Also, in 1837, Thomas Davenport patented the first electric motor. Davenport was a Williamstown-born blacksmith who lived in Forestdale, a village near the town of Brandon. John Deere's hometown of Rutland is shown below. 1864, St. Alfonso's Raid In the northernmost action of the polite or civil war in 1864, Confederate troops crossed the border from Canada into the United States to wreak havoc in an attempt to draw Union forces to the area. This sneaky skullduggery was later christened the St. Alfonso's Raid by Frank Zappa fans and others who appreciate apostrophes. These Reds robbed a bank in Vermont and made the bank tellers pledge allegiance to the Confederacy. Of course, the tellers, those who were not already Confederate sympathizers, that is, crossed their fingers behind their backs while reciting said pledge. The Rebs softened the blow somewhat, though, or was it psychological warfare, blatant boat buying? By passing out complimentary maple bars, a Canadian delicacy, and pecan pie, a southern staple. You've heard of rice Christians, right? The Rebs were attempting to make maple bar confederates or maple bar rebels in this way. It didn't exactly work like gangbusters, though. After all, the Rebs lost the war, 
and nobody has ever heard of this raid, unless they read this scholarly tome either, so obviously there wasn't much to it. The crossing their fingers behind their collective backs trick was kind of special, though, as you can see here, from bank surveillance cameras. Repeat after me, Jefferson Davis, he's our man. If he can't do it, nobody can. 1892, Kipling moves in. Rudyard Kipling moved to Dummerston in 1892. This was the location of the former Fort Dumb and Dumber near Brattleboro. Kipling produced some of his best work while living in Vermont, such as the sing-song stories Mandalay Bay and Gung Ho about a Hawaiian ukuleleist whose given name was actually Dawn. Also streaming from Kipling's pen during these years was his expose, The Jungle, about working conditions in the Vermont sugar bush, and a courageous biography of Captain Kangaroo. It was considered courageous because, in it, Kipling divulges the rest of the story, a la Paul Harvey, of Mr. Green Jeans, to wit, that Green Jeans was not his real name. And not only that, but his jeans weren't really green. His britches only appeared to infest that portion of the electromagnetic spectrum, uh, be that hue, because of a colored filter slapped on the motion picture camera when Green Jeans was in a shot. 1903. Vermonter makes first cross-country automobile trip. Bird on by a $50 bet made in a bar, Vermonter Hubert Horatio Nelson Jackson along with mechanic Sewell Crocker, Betty's brother, and a bulldog named Bud, no relation to the Clydesdale in the television commercials, made a cross-country automobile trip in 1903 from Frisco, San Francisco, California, to the Big Apple, New York. Their car was a 1965 Ford Mustang. Psych, it was a brand new 1903 Winton. Yeah, it was new back then. It would no longer be considered such. The trip took Jackson and Crocker 65 days. You could make it today in three if you pushed it. Or even less if you're stupid and are crazy. On arrival back in Vermont, the authorities saluted Nelson's achievement by arresting him for speeding. The speed limit was six miles per hour at the time. He was fined five dollars. Nelson never bothered to collect on the $50 bet he had made that he could drive all the way across the country in an automobile. 1913. Pollyanna Porter Wagoner wrote his most beloved novel, Pollyanna, in 1913. It is set in the fictional town of Beldingsville, Vermont. Now considered a classic of children's literature, the title character's name has become a popular term for someone who complains all the time. In 1920, the story was flickified. Les Paul and Mary Ford played the lead roles. Walt Disney refilmed the story in 1960. In Disney's version, Haley Selassie and Bob Marley played the protagonists. 1919. Frost comes to Vermont. Until 1919, Vermont was always quite warm, balmy even. In winter, people would come to Vermont to soak up the sun rather than go down to Florida. But then... In that pivotal year, 1919, weren't you paying attention? A poet named Bob Frosty, who sometimes used the unlikely nom de plume Robert Frost, moved to Vermont. So the frost came, and Vermont was never the same. Ever since then, Vermont has been cold in the winter, and sometimes in other seasons too. And so, although Frosty was not a native of Vermont, he eventually became the poet lariat of Vermont. And taking up this mantle, Frosty showed his versatility because, as a poet lariat, he engaged in roping contests at rodeos around the country where he was pitted against other wielders of the gilded quill. Due to his Yankee ingenuity and toughened physique from doing farm work, chopping wood, mucking out stalls, etc., Frost usually won these feats of skill and strength. In fact, you should have seen the time he flipped Edgar Allan Poe over his back and then followed that up with a triple somerset with one leg tied behind his back. The toughness and competitive drive needed by a poet there is plainly seen in this cubist impressionistic painting of him done by Pablo Monet. 1927, Great Vermont Flood There was a great big flood in Vermont in 1927. 
It gave people there the fan to such an extent and degree that it touched off a bridge-building frenzy. There were tons of flooding in 1832, but the people back then didn't get all paranoid about it. They were tougher back then, made from different cloth, burlap, I think, instead of the chiffon and dainty lace of later generations. In a gross overreaction, those who experienced the 1927 flooding even built bridges over dry land, just in case, as they said. As you can see in the carbon copy below, the original wasn't color, but this carbon copy faded the colors tremendously. This edifice was named Bridge Over Troubled Meadow. 1932. Brother, can you spare a dime? During the Great Depression in 1932, Island Pawn's Rudolph Valentino released his single, Brother, Can You Spare a Dime? Nobody could spare a dime at the time, so it was an utter flop. People who needed dimes liked the song, but couldn't afford to buy it. People who had all the dimes they needed didn't care to be panhandled, and so didn't want to support the sentiment by purchasing the song. What a market and nightmare! Rudolph was so angry about this fiasco that his nose turned red, and he threatened to shoot his manager, but then realized that the gun that he thought he was holding was actually a liquor stick, as you can see below. Dang, my clarinet case really did have a clarinet in it. 1945. Justin Morgan had a horse. We've all heard the 1945 children's poem that begins, Justin Morgan had a horse. His fleece was white as snow, and everywhere that Justin went, that horse was sure to mow, etc. If you didn't already know it, you would be thrilled beyond belief to find out that that poem was set in late 18th century Vermont. Here's the horse that Justin Morgan had. El caballo no tengo ni gola cola, fera. 1978, Ban and Jerry in Burlington. Dateline Burlington, 1978. Actually, Burlington is not a date at all, but some people who live there have gone on dates. Double dates, Dutch treat dates, double Dutch chocolate dates, blind dates, first dates, etc. Maybe there's a connection there. But anyway, in 1978 in Burlington, Ben Gurry and Cohen and Jerry Mander Greenfield completed a correspondence course on ice cream making. Cohen has hyperactive sensitivity to smells and tastes and Thus was able to tell exactly which ingredients were used and not used, and more important, in the various flavors and derivations they tried. So, equipped with one guy, Ben Gurion, who was blessed with hypo taste but acidity, a perfect pitch of eating, and hyper olfactoricity, did over smelling, and another guy, gerrymander, with a good sense for business, whatever the market will bear, they finally bit the bullet, so to speak, and opened an ice cream parlor in a renovated nuclear power plant in downtown Burlington in 1978, as previously hinted at. The rest is post-history as seen in this mural of their euphemistic flavors. This ain't Baskin Robbins, whatever that means. 1987, Crossing the Safeway. Crossing the Safeway is a... Sly, 1987 Slice of Life novel by the Dean of Western Writers, Wallace Stegosaurus. It tries to capture and retain the reader's interest while dwelling on a single incident in a rather dull and nondescript day for the protagonist, Morgan Freeman. By the way, when people call Stegosaurus the Dean, they never make it plain whether they're connecting him with James Dean, Rebel, Jimmy Dean, Sausage, or Dean Jones, Donner of Cats and Lover of Bugs. Back to the synopsis. Freeman is ordered by his wife to pick up a pint of Ben and Jerry's ice cream at Safeway in Brattleboro, where they live. On his way home from sitting on the front porch of an old store with his old buddies and spinning yarns. She wants Cherry Garcia, but Morgan forgets and accidentally buys Chunky Plunky. This makes his wife angry, and they quarrel. The last scene fades out with the screen door on the front porch slamming and Springsteen's song Lightning Road playing. You might like it, if you like that kind of thing.